In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Seeking God is central to living a life that's pleasing to God. So I invite you to consider the question Jesus asked some who followed him in John chapter 1 and verse 38. He asked, What do you seek? Certainly there are many different things and people we can spend our earthly lives seeking after, and there are various reasons of why we would want or not want to seek after each of these. In Philippians 2 and verse 21, Paul stated, that all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. His point reminds us that most people choose to seek their own physical desires while they live on this earth, considering the temporary pleasures they will experience through doing so to be worthwhile. However, in this lesson, I want you to consider why you should seek God during the course of your earthly life. In the language of Colossians 3 and verse 1, I want you to consider why you should Seek those things which are above. In contrast with the physical things that most everyone else is seeking on this earth, I hope this lesson will help to convince you to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Matthew 6 and verse 33. During the course of this lesson, consider six powerful reasons you should be seeking God absolutely first during your life. First, I want us to recognize that we should seek God because of who He is. Now, in the first lesson in this series, I suggested that we cannot seek God if we do not know who He is. So we spent our time in that lesson learning about the great and awesome God who is the only true and living God. But the things we discussed in that lesson are not just facts that we should believe. Instead, they should be a primary motivation behind why we seek God. So let's spend a few moments highlighting the main points from lesson one. Recall that the Apostle Paul was in the city of Athens and saw that the city was given to idolatry. He could walk around the city and see that there were religious and devoted people, but devoted to many different gods. And as he observed the idols in their city, he even saw one with the inscription, To the Unknown God as recorded in Acts 17 and verse 23. Therefore, Paul began to instruct them about the one true and living God they did not know. And first, he identified that this God is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one who created the world and everything that's in it, and possesses all authority over it. Second, this God cannot be contained in any temple. Although man has built spectacular structures, including the tabernacle and the temple, none were glorious enough to contain the fullness of this God. Third, this God is not in need of our service. Although he desires mankind to serve and worship him, God is not dependent upon mankind's service or worship. Instead, it is mankind who is fully dependent upon God. Fourth, God is the one who created us. God did not need a creator but man did. Furthermore, God has created us so that we will seek after him, as we'll discuss further in this lesson. Fifth, this God is the one who possesses divine authority, or divine nature. This God is too magnificent to be represented by anything that has been made by man, because this God possesses the full nature of being God. Sixth, this God is the judge of the world. He has the authority to judge the world, and he will do so through Jesus Christ one day. Therefore, in light of this coming judgment, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. At the end of lesson one, I asked you to consider what you will do with this message about God. In Acts 17, verses 32 through 34, some of the people who heard Paul's message originally mocked. Some wanted to hear more, and some believed. So just like these, you must absolutely determine what you will do with this message about God. Go back to Acts 17, verse 27, in order to see what God wants you to do with the understanding of who he really is. Paul said that God has created man so that they should seek the Lord, 
in the hope that they, hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Therefore, this magnificent God, described by Paul in Acts chapter 17, has created you and all mankind with the intention that you and we will seek him. And if we realize, if we really recognize the and accept the truths about this God, shouldn't we want to devote our lives to seeking him? After all, every good thing comes from him. As we discovered in Lesson 1, every good and every perfect gift comes down to us from this God, James 1, verse 17. He is the one who gives to all life, breath, and all things, Acts 17, verse 25. And as Jesus stated in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, he is the one who will provide people even with the necessities of this life, like food and clothing, if they will seek him first. But even more significant than the physical blessings which come from this marvelous God are the spiritual blessings he provides. Although God does bless both those who seek him and those who do not seek him from a physical perspective, as you can see in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 47, he will only bless those who seek after him spiritually. Therefore, this will be a primary focus of this lesson. A second reason of why we should seek God is because he's created us with the ability to seek him. God is truly an awesome God, and this awesome God desires for us to seek him, Acts 17, verse 27. But this would be a worthless endeavor if it was outside of our ability to do so. Thanks be to this God for creating us with the ability to seek him. Therefore, we should dedicate ourselves to making the best use of our lives and seek him in the way he desires to be sought. Now, in lesson one, we discussed the fact that we are the offspring of this God. We considered some passages in Genesis 2 to help us understand that God did create us. But we only considered the special way he has created us very briefly. For the Genesis account of creation identifies that there was something unique about the way in which God has created us that is not true about every other earthly thing he created, like the plants and the animals, etc. This unique characteristic has a direct impact on our abilities to seek God. In Genesis chapter 1, let's read verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice, that God gave mankind a special place in his creation of earthly things. It was only mankind who was made in the image of God. But what image is this? And what does being made in God's own image even mean for us? Is this a physical resemblance with God? Not at all. God does not possess a physical element to his existence like a human body. Instead, Jesus said that God is spirit, John 4, verse 24. Therefore, even though mankind does have a physical existence, these passages help us to understand that there is more to our existence than this. We also possess a spiritual nature, a soul. Therefore, we have the ability to have a relationship with God and seek after him, as we saw in Acts 17, verses 26 through 28. To see that this is true, I want you to consider man's relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. God prepared a garden for man to live in that was a paradise on this earth, with no death, no suffering, no sickness, etc. Furthermore, I would encourage you to read Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13, and consider what this passage indicates about the relationship the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, had with God in this place. While information is limited regarding the specifics of this relationship, This passage occurs right after Adam and Eve sinned against God and offers a small glimpse into the relationship they had with God. He directly communicated with them, and he walked among them in some way. 
Yet after they sinned, their relationship was changed and they experienced death. Physical death would result from their being separated from the tree of life, which had been in the Garden of Eden, and spiritual death resulted from the separation they had experienced with God. Similarly, we have also been created in the image of God and have the ability to be in fellowship with our awesome Creator and Lord. And having a spiritual nature, we possess souls that will survive physical death and continue to exist. And you can go into 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8 to see even more about that. Being created in God's image, God has given us free will, allowing us either to spend our earthly lives seeking Him or seeking other things, just as Adam and Eve possessed the same free will. Unfortunately, most people who live on this earth choose to waste their earthly lives by seeking physical things. While God gives us the free will to do this, He also warns us that there will that doing so will not result in long-term happiness. Jesus asked in Matthew 16 and verse 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? All of the physical things you will accumulate by seeking them are only temporary. And then you will lose your soul and experience consequences for how you've lived. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes recognized the foolishness of seeking after physical things, recognizing their temporary nature. And then he offered this conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. In light of the fact that God will bring everything that we do while we have lived on this earth into judgment, as we also saw in Acts 17, in verses 30 and 31, we should recognize that the only thing that's truly worthwhile in life is to spend our entire lives seeking God, fearing Him, and keeping His commandments. And we do this knowing that God's promise that if we seek Him, we will also find Him, as you can read in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, and Acts 17, verse 27. Next, why should we seek God? Well, because sin has separated us from God. We've seen that, uh, that we waste our lives if we do not seek God. Now, recognize that it is when we have failed to seek God with our whole hearts that we sin against God. In Psalm 119, verses 10 to 11, it says, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Sin, by its very definition, is failing to live according to the law God has given us to live by. 1 John 3, verse 4. And the seriousness involved when we commit sin is that we separate ourselves from this God we should be seeking in our lives. And we'll observe the consequences of doing this later. In order to understand sin properly, we must understand first another element of God's nature. That is that he is holy. Revelation uh, 4 verses 6 through 8, there are four living creatures who are magnificently described. One is like a lion. One is like a calf. One had a face like a man. And one was like a flying eagle. These four living creatures each had six wings and were full of eyes around and within. Then I want you to notice what these magnificent creatures were doing in heaven. These were around the throne of the Almighty God who is, in, who is Lord of heaven and earth, unceasingly proclaiming, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Yes, this Almighty God is a holy God. But what exactly does it mean for this God to be that we seek to be holy? And how does it impact our attempts to seek Him? First, understand what it means for God to be holy. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 helps us in this effort. It says, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. There is nothing evil that exists in God. He is entirely good and pure. He is as separated from evil as light is separated from darkness. 
Second, understand that our holy God also calls us to be holy as he is holy. Listen to 1 Peter 1. In verses 15 and 16, Peter, after instructing some Christians not to live their lives according to their former desires, when they were living for the ways of sin, said, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Just as God is holy in all of his nature, he desires for us to be separated from everything that's evil. So sin makes us enemies of God. As Psalm 14 verses 1 through 3 identifies, as we read and briefly discussed in lesson 1, none of us have sought God perfectly in our lives. We have all sinned and fallen short of glorifying God in our lives, Romans 3 verse 23. And whenever we sin against God, our relationship with him has changed. We go from having fellowship and friendship with him to being his enemies. Consider Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Whenever we are separated from God and find ourselves as his enemies, we should absolutely be assured that the problem is not with God. God did not sever the relationship. Instead, it is our sin that separates us from God. This separation from God is spiritual death. And Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. It is therefore what we earn or deserve whenever we sin. 1 John 1 verse 6 helps us understand why this is so. Recall from verse 5 that identified the fact that God is as separated from evil as light is from darkness. And then verse 6 says, If we say that we have, no, have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We simply cannot remain in fellowship with a perfectly holy God whenever we do things that are contrary to his nature. 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17 instructs us not to love the world or the things of the world because... The things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father. They're not of God, but are of the world. They are contrary to God's holy, way, holy nature, and they are only temporary. Therefore, whenever we live according to our own fleshly desires, rather than do the things God desires us to do, we make ourselves the enemies of the Almighty God who will judge us. James 4 and verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hostility with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And next, why should we seek God? Because of what God has done for us. So sin is what se has separated us from the Almighty God we studied about in Lesson 1. And we have all committed sin. Therefore, sin is what has accelerated the need to seek after God. The problem is that no matter how diligently we try to seek after God, we cannot undo the sin we have committed and the separation we have made between us and God. At least we cannot do this by ourselves. Fortunately, God has loved us enough to provide his Son as the Savior of the world to provide us with the opportunity to be restored to a place of friendship and fellowship with him. So given the significance of the sacrifice that was made for us, we should be driven to seek God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. In Romans 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We all deserve to experience the consequences of sinning against our holy God. However, God has provided the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Along with being holy, this almighty creator is also full of love. 1 John 4 and verse 8 says that God is love. Surely this God has demonstrated his love toward us in many ways, but there has been no greater manifestation of God's love than in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. John 3 verse 16 explains, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's attempt to gain a greater appreciation of this truth by examining this verse in more detail. First, God so loved the world. This includes everyone who has sinned or will ever sin against God. They had decided not to seek God, choosing instead to seek their own selfish desires. They had been separated from fellowship with this holy God and were his enemies. Yet even when we were sinners and his enemies, God loved us. Second, God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. This is Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus also possessed the nature of being God, he willingly left heaven and came to this earth in order to fulfill the eternal plan of salvation God had prepared. And even though Jesus did not commit any sin while he lived on this earth, Hebrews 4 verse 15, Jesus willingly experienced the hatred of this world, was arrested, was falsely accused, was severely beaten, was mocked, was spat upon, and was nailed to the cross. There, having had nails driven through his hands and his feet, Jesus Christ hung until he died, as you can read about Matthew 26 and 27. God the Father willingly gave his Son to endure all of this, and Jesus Christ experienced these things because of their love for the world. Then God also raised up Jesus from the dead, Matthew 20, as you can read about Matthew 28. Third, God loved us, in, God loved us and gave his only begotten Son so that Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is what is accomplished through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It gives those who believe in him the opportunity to not perish, to not experience the consequences of the sins they had committed, and to have everlasting life, an opportunity that was forfeited whenever we committed sin. We'll explore both of these in just a moment, but before we do, I want us to recognize that this blessing is not unconditional. This verse identifies belief as a necessary requirement. Now, please understand that this belief is not merely a mental acceptance of who Jesus is. But remember that Hebrews 11 verse 6 is quoted at the beginning of the lesson, said that we must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So seeking God is at the heart of receiving this gift of God. Now, we should allow the love of Christ to control us. 1 John 4, verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Given everything God has done for us and showing love toward us, we should love him enough that we will seek him with all of our beings. In Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said that the greatest commandment in the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I want you to now consider two passages that help us understand how the love God has shown to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ ought to motivate us to seek God. Yes, God wants us to be motivated to seek Him by His love. First, consider 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. Paul writes, that the love Christ has demonstrated for us ought to compel us. That is, it ought to control us. All of our decisions in life. To recognize that Jesus Christ died for us. Surely such a great manifestation of love for us ought to motivate us to live no longer for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and rose again. Second, consider Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. The passage begins by stating that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's gift of salvation has been made, made available for everyone. And this opportunity to be saved ought to impact our lives in such a way that we would turn away from living for sin so that we can live for God and be ready for the day Jesus Christ will come in final judgment. And then verse 14 says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That is, Jesus Christ did not sacrifice his life on the cross so that we, would, we could continue to seek after earthly things. Rather, he died so that we will seek him and zealously live according to his instructions. Next, as we think about why we should seek God, we must seek Him because of what it means 
if we do. If we allow the love of Christ to control us and zealously seek Him during the course of our physical lives, we are promised great blessings. Remember, God has promised to judge the world by Jesus Christ one day, as we saw in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. And recall that Hebrews 11, verse 6 identifies that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we should be dedicated to seeking God because of what it means if we do. You see, we can be reconciled to God. At one time, we were separated from God when we were living in our sins, but through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is now reconciliation possible. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The Greek word that's translated as reconciled in the New King James Version of the Bible has the meaning of changing or exchanging money for that of equivalent value. The spiritual application of this principle is seen in that we were spiritually bankrupt in our sins. The only way for us to be brought into a right relationship with our holy God was through the blood of Jesus Christ. There was nothing we could offer to God as, even, as an even exchange to cover our sins. We were in desperate need of Jesus' blood to reconcile us to God. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, it says that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The idea of a mediator is someone who intervenes between two others in order to make or restore peace and friendship between the two sides. This is exactly what Jesus has accomplished for us. Jesus has made it possible for the enemies of God to become friends of God. But as we've already established, this is not done unconditionally. For instance, Romans 5 and verse 1 says, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not everyone who's living on this earth is seeking to be reconciled to God. In fact, Jesus said most people will suffer the consequences of their sins because they will not seek Him. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, verse 3 makes it abundantly clear that every spiritual blessing that God provides is only found in Christ. So it's our responsibility to do what God requires to be in Christ, as you can see in Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. And we'll be examining more about what is involved in this in future lessons. And then we learn we can be we can live eternally with God in heaven. Remember that we've been created with a soul that survives physical death. Therefore, we need to consider the implications of seeking God on what will happen to us after our earthly lives are over. Consider a few passages that should help us understand the eternal blessings that would be given to those who seek God during their earthly lives. First, Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says that Jesus Christ has become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the tremendous opportunity to be saved from the consequences of our sins and have everlasting life in heaven. Second, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 teaches that we will reap what we've sown. So if we sow to the Spirit throughout our earthly lives, then we will reap everlasting life. That is, those who devote their earthly lives to living according to God's instructions as revealed by the Spirit of God will be given everlasting life in heaven. And third, Romans 2 and verse 7 says that eternal life will be given to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. On the day when God judges the world through Jesus Christ, these who have sought God and the things he provides will be granted this eternal life. That this everlasting or never-ending life is in heaven with God can be seen from many passages. First, Jesus promised his disciples that he would return and take them who, to a, the place he was preparing to go, as you read in John 14, verses 1 through 6, and this was a reference to heaven. Jesus said that he was going to prepare a place for them and that there are many dwelling places in heaven. Second, Jesus pictured the final judgment day in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. 
And in doing so, Jesus identified that the righteous would be told on the de- that day to come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, verse 34. And third, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, it says that when Jesus comes, the righteous will meet the Lord in the air and will always be with the Lord. Fourth, in Revelation 21 and into chapter 22 and verse 5, it depicts this place where those who sought God during their earthly lives will spend eternity. It's pictured as a place of rest, a place that is free from evil, pain, suffering, and death, and a place whose beauty is unimaginable. But best of all, this passage pictures God as being in this place. And finally, regarding why we should seek God, We should seek God because of what it means if we don't. Just as there are blessings and rewards that are associated with seeking God, there are consequences and punishment associated with failing to seek God. So as you determine whether you desire to seek God or not, you need to understand what the consequences are for failing to seek God. First, we need to recognize that if we fail to seek God, we will remain remain separated from God. During the time that we live on this earth, those who fail to seek God will remain separated from God in their sins. They will remain the enemies of God. They will fail to have access to the spiritual blessings God has provided in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6 references such a condition whenever the text speaks of the reality that the one who lives for his or her own earthly pleasure and enjoyment will be dead while living. That is, this individual will be spiritually dead in sin that is separated from the Almighty God while living physically. However, while this kind of life offers physical pleasures, it has no hope. This is because this kind of life only has hope in the temporary things of life, And then after this life is over, this individual will be separated from all that he or she enjoyed and still be spiritually bankrupt in sin. Ephesians 2 and verse 12 depicts the reality of a life that is apart from Jesus Christ as being without hope and without God in the world. Therefore, this is a meaningless way to spend your life on this earth. Next, Although this kind of earthly life is devastating enough, the worst is yet to come for such a one. Having a soul that survives physical death, there is an eternal consequence involved in dying physically while being dead spiritually. Just as those who were diligent in living according to God's instructions will reap what they sow, those who live to fulfill their own fleshly desires will also reap what they have sown, as you can see in Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8. The difference is that they will reap corruption rather than everlasting life. Consider a few passages that should help to warn you about the eternal punishment awaiting those who fail to seek the Lord during their earthly lives and die in their sins. First, listen to the words Jesus will say to those who fail to seek God during their earthly lives. In Matthew 25 and verse 41, Jesus said, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me. You cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then verse 46 says that these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Once again, this passage is in the context of the final judgment. On this day, those who failed to see God during their earthly lives will be instructed to depart from the presence of God. Thus, they will be separated from him for all of eternity sentenced to a never-ending punishment in a place that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Second, consider Romans 2 in verses 8 and 9. On this day of judgment, when those who have been diligently obedient to God will be rewarded, as we see in verses 7 and 10, this passage says, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Therefore, the one who is self-seeking will experience the wrath of the all-powerful God we studied about in Lesson 1. And as Zephaniah 1 verse 18 demonstrates, no one will be able to deliver himself or herself from the wrath of God, not even with silver and gold. Third, 
Consider 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. While those who seek God will be granted rest when the Lord returns, according to verse 7, verses 8 and 9 pictures, the following is the fate of those who do not seek him. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Notice that these who do not obey God will experience two things. They will experience the wrath of the, of the God they should have sought, and they will be eternally separated from him. And fourth, consider Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This eternal punishment for those who have failed to seek God will be in the place the Bible calls hell, as you can see in Matthew 10, verse 28. The scriptures consistently picture this place as being full of everything that we would find undesirable and a place of full of anguish. Particularly, this passage pictures it as a lake that is burning with fire and brimstone and identifies it as the second death. And as we've already seen, this place will be the eternal, a place of eternal separation, spiritual death, because of that everlasting separation from God. Thus, it is separation from everything that is good. There is surely ample reason to seek after the God who is Lord of heaven and earth. In fact, it is the only truly worthwhile thing that you will do with your life on this earth. For if you miss out on the opportunity to spend eternity with God in heaven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you have missed everything that is worth anything. So will you seek God? Will you allow these truths to impact your life in every area so as to seek God? Or will you refuse to accept these truths or only partially accept them so as to live your life for your own physical desires? Either way, please recognize that you will stand before the Almighty God one day in judgment and you will reap what you have sown.